So we're continuing here from uh, the review and discussion of the first few sections of this chapter on human evolution. And where we ended in the last part, part one, was uh, introducing Australopithecines and pointing out the wide diversity of Australopithecines and uh, a fairly long time period in which they existed. Um, it's pretty clear that the genus Homo, which is what we're focused on and talking about right now, right here, evolved from Australopithecines. We can say that because of the uh, timeline, uh, the emergence of the genus Homo uh, well within the time period that Australopithecines were around but also character state evidence uh, makes it clear that uh, uh, Homo and Australopithecine share characteristics, but Homo is a bit more derived. So we know that uh, on, this, uh, on the basis of these data that Homo came from Australopithecines, and we also can see that there's a remarkable amount of diversity of Homo that there was a wide range of evolution going on. And I pose the question here on the slide, why might that be? So of course, when we ask a question like that, it's evolutionary in origin, why? We're talking about an ultimate question. We're talking about a question about origins, uh, perhaps about adaptation. You know, what is it about the genus Homo that was adaptive that might explain why they were diverse. So with that kind of uh, uh, frame of thought, you know, maybe uh, adaptations up to this point allowed Homo to spread geographically and adapt to a wider, wider more uh, broad range of um, prey, you know, uh, and hunting and in diets. Uh, also invading new regions with different habitats and different climates would favor uh, adaptation, local adaptation to different places. So th these are possibilities, and I certainly would want you to think about and entertain those possibilities and think of uh, any other reasons that uh, reasonably, logically could explain the, the great diversity that we see in the fossil record. So uh, moving on here, the earliest Homo fossil is about 2.8 million years old, but we only know it from a jaw fragment that's shown in the top uh, right of the slide here. And we know it's in the genus Homo because of the jaw itself, uh, the morphology, the anatomy of it, and the small teeth. The teeth are characteristic of Homo, like us. They're not characteristic of Australopithecines. Now the figure on the bottom right uh, shows and depicts uh, Homo erectus, uh, which is um, uh, very the longest lasting lineage. If you go back to figure 17.7, .7, which uh, I referred to up at the top of the slide, you can see that uh, uh, diversity of hominins that uh, over the time span, over a time range, and you can see Homo erectus uh, existed for quite a long time, for quite a long time compared to others. So what we see in Homo erectus is that the arboreal adaptations that um, early hominins had and retained from our, you know, ape ancestors are mostly lost. And the preponderance of adaptations that we see in Homo erectus uh, and shared with us are adaptations for walking and running. If you take a look at the uh, figure B in the bottom right, um, those anato anatomical parts that have the notation of lowercase uh, uh, w are suggesting those are, that's an adaptation for walking. And those uh, annotations that have a lowercase r are arguably adaptations for running. 
And uh, also remember from the uh, chapter introduction, it talked about homo naledi. And, you know, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I haven't looked up the pronunciation, but, you know, Latin, Greek, it, I think it would be homo naledi. But uh, it branched off early in homo evolution, very early, over two million years ago. And yet it still shares some unique traits with our own species. So that is indicative of how Homo was different from Australopithecines. And even with this very early species of Homo, Homo naledi, it uh, has traits that it shares with us and not Australopithecines. For example, as noted on the very bottom left here, wrist bones that are associated with tool making. Uh, now, because this species appeared so early and we are nested a little higher up in the Homo clade, in the Homo tree, there's a couple possible hypotheses as to why they share uh, unique traits like the, the wrist bones with us. Maybe it's convergent evolution. Uh, maybe they evolved that independently from us. Maybe there was hybridization that uh, passed those traits from lineage to lineage, species to species. You know, clearly we don't know at this point. We may never know, but these are the kinds of questions that arise when we discover fossils that show traits like these and we want to understand their origins. Something we do not see in Australopithecines, but we do see in our own genus Homo, is that uh, we, as Homo, uh, expanded out of Africa and migrated to new continents moved into Europe, moved into Asia, and of course our own species eventually made it into North America and Australia and South America, but that was much later. So as noted in the top right of the slide, there's potential stone tools. It's controversial amongst uh, archaeologists just whether they are definitively stone tools made by hominins or not. But they look like, you know, stone tools, and they're found in Eastern Asia about 2.1 million years ago. You can see that in the figure on the left-hand side of the slide. But there's no hominin fossils associated with these uh, apparent stone tools, so some uh, archaeologists uh, aren't convinced that they're tools, and they, they want to find fossils that... Uh, are in the same uh, place at the same time. About 1.8 million years ago, we see fossils in uh, the area of Indonesia that are very similar to Homo erectus uh, uh, fossils that we see in Africa at the same time. So this is, of course, suggestive to us that Homo erectus is the species that moved out of Africa and uh, was among the first to invade uh, Asia and to make it all the way into Indonesia. Um, it's doubtful that they constructed rafts, that they had the technology to do that. Can't say it's impossible, so um, potentially they rafted out there, you know, accidentally, like other animals have uh, rafted to islands and uh, dispersed and colonized new places, perhaps. Uh, there's 1.8 million year old fossils from the region of uh, Georgia in Asia. Uh, I guess maybe that's um, Eastern Europe, Western Asia. And um, they have very small brains, about 600 cubic centimeters, which you might remember is about on par with a, a Homo habilis. And uh, so, you know, are these a different species or perhaps they are a geographic variant of Homo habilis, but Homo habilis has only been found in uh, Africa. But to try to explain this particular, you know, uh, fossil that has a brain size that's concordant with Homo habilis, that's why we might draw that connection. Similar brain size. 
Um, so, you know, the question near the bottom left of the slide, why were such a broad range of homo variants living outside of Africa? Um, as I may have uh, mentioned at the beginning of this slide, maybe they uh, represent recent adaptations to a broad range of habitats. So given, just to expand on that, given that Homo is moving into these new places with distinctly different habitats from northern latitudes of, you know, Europe and Asia to tropical regions of Indonesia, just like we'd ex uh, see and expect in other species of animals, there would be local adaptation to those habitats. Um, maybe environmental conditions were simply favorable for uh, Homo to be invading these places. So just like we would think about with other species of animals in terms of explaining their variation, we're going to think about our own human ancestry in the same way and uh, try to understand what we know in the same way. Finally, in the bottom right of the slide, there's a depiction of Homo floresiensis, which is a fascinating species. I remember the discovery of this one in the early 2000s was uh, really rocking paleontology and uh, the field of you know, understanding human origins. Why? Because this uh, species which is kind of referred to as the hobbit species, was only a hundred centimeters tall, was only about a meter tall. It was a tiny human, if we use the term human broadly. Um, and proportional to that small size, though, it had a tiny brain, which does not scale to the size of a brain that a Homo erectus would have, but would scale more to the size of a brain that an Australopithecine would have. So it was really kind of perplexing to paleontologists just how to evolutionarily classify this species. Um, it has homo characteristics, and yet something like this tiny brain is more of an Australopithecine characteristic. So maybe it represents an early wave of homo habilis. Uh, moving um, around the planet and getting uh, to um, this part of Indonesia, you know, at least 700,000 years ago. So, and, and a notable for this guy is that it existed up to about 60,000 years ago. So what I'm saying about notable is not only is that not very long ago, but that kind of overlaps with when our own species, Homo sapiens, was spreading across this region and making its way towards Australia. And maybe it's possible that Homo sapiens, our own species, encountered these guys and killed them off. Maybe. So this section is talking about tool use in um, humans, the emergence of modern traits in Homo, but focused on tool use. And uh, very early Homo tools, by early, we're talking about 2.6 million years ago, that would be very early Homo. They are referred to Oldowan as Oldowan technology. So that's in reference to the area in, uh, Tanzania where these tools have been found, the Oldowan region. So we call it Oldowan technology. And the upper left image from your textbook figure is showing these types of Oldowan tools or technology. And they all sort of form a similar pattern. There's not a lot of variation in the tool in the types of tools. They all seem to kind of belong to what we might call the same toolkit. Um, rocks that have been chipped uh, in such a way for cutting. The Aculean technology, Aculean technology that dates to about 1.8 million years ago, so almost, uh, you know, a million, well, 800,000 years after the origin of the older one. That's shown in the bottom left, and you can see they look a little bit more advanced. 
advanced, if you will. And the Aculean technology includes what we might refer to as hand axes. Uh, clearly much bigger. You can see the little uh, scale, size scale bar in the two figures, and you can see those hand axes are bigger. And we might expect that they were being used to maybe cut through tough skins of elephants or mammoths. We might uh, hypothesize that. These um, Aculean tools originated in Africa. That's where we first see them. But then uh, we see they rapidly appeared in Europe and Asia. So that technology spread fairly quickly. And then finally on the bottom here, the pace of technological change was very slow. And that's documented in the figure on the bottom uh, that shows a range, a chronological sequence of uh, Aculean tools over the time period of about 900,000 years, so almost a million years. But the pace of change in these tools based on that very large time span shows they weren't advancing, if you will, their technology very quickly. So perhaps this suggests that language had not developed to any significant degree at this point. No way to sort of pass on knowledge or teach in a, a manner through language that could advance technology. So these uh, tools are more advanced than what Australopithecines had, um, and uh, they coincide with genus Homo that has bigger brains and would be more capable to make such tools. But again, like I just said a moment ago, to sort of summarize, not showing a big wide range of tools that are advancing at a very uh, fast time scale. So going along with this, uh, you know, newer repertoire of tools, uh, we might then discuss the anatomy of creatures in the genus Homo and um, how this tool use might be reflective of our anatomy uh, being more of a hunter type body. Perhaps species in the genus Homo indeed were adapting to a hunting lifestyle, now, adapting not just behaviorally, but anatomically. So uh, anatomical traits of uh, Homo are well documented from fossils. We, we know what the anatomy of um, uh, Homo is like, but what's the adaptive significance of these anatomical traits? Uh, how are they adaptive? And so here's a, a list of uh, Homo anatomical features that um, kind of coincide with how they might be adaptive for tool use and tool making and hunting. So, for example, hands, the anatomy of uh, hands and Homo uh, uh, is reflective of finer motor skills. And of course, these finer motor skills could help build or fashion better, more advanced tools. Uh, our legs in the genus Homo are long, uh, our hips are narrow, and having long legs, legs with narrow hips is conducive and helpful to long distance walking, which coincides with the type of hunting that we do. Uh, we have muscles in our necks that arguably are neck stabilizing muscles, and those might be supportive of running because you know when we do run, then you know, our body's bouncing around more. We need to be more rigid to support ourselves, and those muscles would be helpful for that. How about our loss of hair? A uh, relatively hairless primate, and we sweat a lot, <laughs> certainly a lot more than our living primates do. So the loss of hair and more sweat glands would very much be related to more efficient heat exchange that we would need to have while running in Africa, where it's relatively hot. And then finally, having a narrow rib cage, Australopithecines had big barrel-like cages, 
which is suggestive of them having longer digestive systems and intestines, as well as their teeth, that would be uh, focused on a plant diet. Our narrow rib cage suggests a shorter digestive system that is more indicative of having a diet with more meat. And um, if we, you know, we're becoming more of meat eaters uh, because we're able to access it through hunting by the use of our tools, that would support a larger brain because we would then have uh, access to more calories and our brain demands a lot of calories. So our ability to hunt, our ability to make tools to hunt uh, would result then in a shorter digestive system to accommodate the digestion of that meat and having a shorter digestive system would energetically favor a bigger, larger brain. So our title here of Parallel humans, you guys have been introduced to the concept of parallel evolution, like species living concurrently at the same time in similar environments or evolving similar traits in parallel. Uh, so we see evidence of parallel evolution in humans. We see evidence of two or more species of humans existing at the same time. Um, and um, evolving similar traits and similar characteristics. So Homo heidelbergensis uh, is a species that dates back um, quite, a, quite a ways. Uh, um, and Homo heidelbergensis is found in Africa and into Europe. The brain size of Homo heidelbergensis is, uh, was about 1,200 cubic centimeters. And this is on the lower end of our own brain size. So they had pretty big brains. Um, we have evidence of them making long wooden spears up to three meters long. <laughs> Those are pretty long wooden spears. And new types of uh, rock blades about 400,000 years ago. And we have evidence that they used, uh, uh, you know, their hunting technology as well as the types of blades that they developed to butcher horses and to hunt rhinos. The uh, fossils of rhinos that we have suggest that they were driven off of cliffs and killed and then butchered at the bases of these cliffs. We even have evidence of cooking that uh, members of Homo heidelbergensis did uh, in terms of processing their meat. Now, also at about 400,000 years ago, we have Homo neanderthalensis, which we refer to as Neanderthals or Neanderthals, and that's after the region in France where they were discovered, the Neanderthal region. And so Neanderthals are 400,000 years old, and they survived and existed up to about 40,000 years ago, same time as our own species was around. So compared to Homo sapiens, compared to us, Neanderthals had wider shoulders and hips and overall had a greater muscle mass. So they were a bulkier organism than we are. Um, they lived in, at, in pretty extreme environments too, in uh, Northern Europe, you know, at the edges of glaciers and so on, uh, during some pretty cold times in the Pleistocene. So their anatomy may have been a bit adapted for these kind of more challenging climates. Uh, anatomically, they had a distinct brow ridge compared to us. We do not have one. They had wider noses, broad, wide noses, and almost no chin. However, their brains were very big. They were as large and sometimes even larger than the brains of uh, Homo sapiens, us. Their diet was very broad. Uh, we can tell, of course, from paleontological evidence, uh, including a wide range of hunted animals uh, over the expanses of Europe and Asia. Uh, so they were quite talented and quite diverse in their hunting strategies and their access to food. 
And then finally, you know, kind of depicted in the bottom right of this slide, there is evidence that uh, members of Homo neanderthalensis made jewelry, like shells with holes drilled in the shells. They may have made necklaces out of those. Um, claws uh, that are, you know, carved and maybe used as necklaces, sim uh, so symbolic sort of features of expression which is something that we normally associate with us as homo sapiens, but there is increasing evidence of symbolic expression and symbolism in Neanderthals. And then finally, there's our own species. So we've worked up through hominin evolution to get to us, homo sapiens, which I see now in narrating the slide. I didn't even put homo sapiens on the slide, but the slide should have homo sapiens on it. Um, our oldest homo sapien fossil is about 300,000 years old. So a little bit younger by 100,000 years than the oldest Neanderthals. And for the first 200,000 years of our existence, we broadly occurred in Africa. After that, for the past 100,000 years, we dispersed uh, up into Europe and Asia, and eventually, of course, into North America and South America. What we see with our species in comparison to even Neanderthals is a very rapid acceleration of tool development which is depicted in the bottom left of this slide, uh, including evidence of trading, you know, tools that then appear geographically in different regions over short time periods that almost uh, uh, certainly, you know, indicate trading amongst, you know, cultures, tribes, whatever. Um, self-expression is depicted in the bottom right-hand corner. We see evidence of self-expression in Homo sapiens by 70,000 years ago, including some types of jewelry like shells with holes drilled in them, you know, necklace kinds of things. But also what the picture in the bottom right is showing is fragments of uh, etched ostrich shells and these ostrich shells were used as water containers, but what appears to be etching, of course, is a form of self-expression and symbolism. So now the last little note here is that while as we see our own species, Homo sapiens, migrating out of Africa and going through Europe and Asia, what we also see at the same time is the uh, other species of Homo going extinct. So there's been quite a bit of debate and comparative evidence battered back and forth as to whether they went extinct for you know, reasons having to do with say climate change or whether we were a major cause of those extinctions by the virtue of the fact that you know, perhaps we had such uh, better advanced technologies and uh, you know better brain use, if you will, that we simply outcompeted them, and maybe we even physically fought them and killed them. But the fact is, is that they did go extinct uh, as we spread into other continents, and we are the sole surviving lineage species of homo after seeing of hominins excuse me of hominins after seeing evidence of at least 20 different species over the past say 7 million years we're the only ones left